You're now listening to the Something Good Podcast Network. Please press any key to continue. A kiss, as defined by Dan Webster, is something pleasing, a caress, a gentle touch. But there's another kiss that isn't in Webster's. Hey world, we're kids! Some critics say they don't make music, they just make noise. Yeah, kiss sucks! Kiss implies the extreme in the theatrics on stage, utilizing fire and smoke and bizarre costumes and the ever-consistent, constant concealment of their true identities. Speaking of which, Kiss is going to have its own comic book soon. Take Kiss with you. It's fun. Show your friends and be the first. Now. No! Oh my God! No time to turn! Welcome once again to No Time to Turn, a Kiss Nerd Podcast. Nerds! Fucking nerds. So, here we are. We're deep into... Uh, 1975. And joining again. me is, as always, Alex Stiff and Cap Nunn. Hello, guys. Howdy, howdy. And uh, we have been trekking and tracking and trudging through the history of Kiss thus far. We are now... Uh, we just uh, wrapped up, I guess, the Hotter Than Hell album. That's correct. Mm-hmm. And now we're launching kind of into the uh, tour in the uh, days leading into Dress to Kill. All of this is blurring together rather quickly, if you have not noticed already, because there's not a lot of breathing and downtime for, for the band here. This just is record, a, tour, a record, tour, tour, record, tour, record, tour, record, tour, record. They're really working at a breakneck breakneck pace mm-hmm. and trying to uh, break into the uh, consciousness of America, which so far has not been working out so great for them. Of course, no. we know their fortunes will eventually change, but at this point, they're still a perennial opening act. And in mm-hmm. some cases, they are starting to headline in uh, areas where they have have gained a little bit of traction. So things are just now starting to kind of gain a little momentum. Easy for me to say. Some kind of a and kind of limbo in between, you know, uh, support acts and headlining acts. Like I'm looking at all the support acts that they've had uh, in 1974, leading up to uh, January, and it's everybody from Black Oak, Arkansas, to T Rex, to ZZ Top, to Wishbone Ash. Probably more them opening for those other groups. Might be right. I don't think it's them having them open for them. That's you know or. That doesn't make any sense. I know exactly what you meant. Right. And, uh, but Paul actually said, uh, looking at the Higher Than Hill tour leading up to where we're going to be discussing also Address to Kill, Paul states, uh, touring in the early days was both grueling and great. I think we were getting paid $60 a week, but we felt like we were living the dream. We were in a rock band and a rented station wagon, but it was all extremely exciting. We felt we were on a mission and we were on the road to glory. We were a gang of people on a crusade who believed in something and were willing to do anything to promote it. There was a tremendous camaraderie in the band despite our differences and the people around us shared that passion yeah they really were uh i think a a young hungry upstart band trying to you know establish what would become what we're talking about now and Mm -hmm. i think that feeds into uh, the material that came in the the next album that excitement yeah well let's talk about this tour a little Mm -hmm. bit now we we've left off and they're they're going again it's kind of constant touring so essentially what we're in now is the hotter than hell tour yeah the post the album the album uh what, what, do you have the date of when that album shipped they're going to call it a release date but i think it's really kind of a ship date or a I would say week March, of, see not march of uh, uh it says here for hotter than hell it was uh, october uh, october 24th. 22nd of 74 Four, excuse me yeah that's correct so late october so now you've got two the the debut album and the follow-up are both in the year 1974 Mm -hmm. very relatively close i mean very close together not relatively Mm -hmm. they are they're very very close together so the band has already got two albums out they're still touring and uh as we talked about last time a lot of it's concentrated in the midwest kind of Mm -hmm. great lakes area midwest and the southeast a lot too like they're still coming back to uh, charlotte and greenville and atlanta and places like that too yeah Mm -hmm. so they're 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 trying to hit a lot of these places they're not getting broke on radio their singles aren't necessarily charting. Uh, their albums aren't even really necessarily charting. As I understand it, Hotter Than Hell actually didn't fare as well as the debut album. That is no. not a good thing. No. no. So they're not even building. They're kind of regressing as far as album sales. 
but there seems to be a buzz on their live act. Mm -hmm. And it's crazy to think that uh, just earlier in the year of 74, uh, Kiss was playing that tiny little club in Charlotte, and then on this tour with Black Oak, Arkansas, and James Montgomery, they played Charlotte Coliseum. Yeah, but that's them opening for Black Oak, Arkansas. Yeah, and that was November 28th of 74 for our Charlotteans here. There's a couple of... uh, shows they did with black oak arkansas and they got in trouble with them for some reason it seemed like the story is their pyro seemed to have caught a curtain on fire or something like this i was gonna say was it that or was it the uh, the blood act and like they didn't clean up after themselves and that like pissed off one of the headliners sounds like kind of like iffy to me that sounds like does it yeah but i mean my point is that either way if that's the case or if the alleged fire was the case that also sounds a little that sounds more possible yeah uh, but in either way these are incidents that are used to kick the band off the off the tour any excuse yeah. any excuse in, 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 in lieu of outright saying this group's blowing us off the stage they don't want to and who would want to admit that you know there's in hindsight you know Ozzy would later acknowledge that was the truth with Black Sabbath but um, right. th- that doesn't come very often uh, in the book uh, Nothing to Lose which is an excellent Kiss book they have a lot of uh, quotes from the bands that Kiss opened for or played with in that era and most of them are pretty positive you know and I think but again this is all coming from hindsight and no one wants to admit they were ever wrong about anything no, of you know so not. you get guys like Kim Simmons from Savoy Brown going well you know they were nothing like us so we thought they were great you know <laughs> yeah but he still probably kicked them off the tour at some point saying no 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 no, no. <laughs> then there's the famous Argent story now I don't know if this is an apocryphal story or not but it's a fun story and it's fun to believe where they're given all kinds of grief about everything from from how much staging they can use to how much lighting they can use, et cetera, so on and so forth, to an encore. And Kiss gets called for an encore, and the road manager from Argent says, no, no, no. It's because they were only allowed to play, what, eight songs? I don't know, but that's probably part of the deal, too. Mm-hmm. And then, famously, if the story is to believe, the Kiss roadies find the kiss or the argent road manager and lock them in a, an equipment trunk <laughs> and kiss all of a sudden find themselves going out for an encore and then another encore and then another encore and not understanding why all of a sudden we getting to do this it's, it's a great story is it true i would love for it to i'd be. love it for it to be true but you, there's a part of it there i go ah, you print you know? the legend yeah, you always, always print, print the, the legend, legend. <laughs> it's a well, great I'll, story i'll defend it on this aspect you could get away with a lot more shit in the 70s. Oh, yeah, of course. So that almost doesn't feel too far off that that crew would have done yeah, that and not that. gotten in trouble for it. Yeah, but it might have hurt them in their prospects with being picked up by someone else. Well, oh, yeah. wait a minute. We heard this. <laughs> yeah. You know, these guys are trouble. So it might be more, you know, there already were enough trouble going in ahead of it. But I think, you know, the, the, the other... Uh, flip of the coin here is and groups are seeing that kiss were a benefit to drawing an audience exactly and i'm also noticing all uh talking about drawing an audience this, i'm noticing a whole lot of dates with zz top on this run too yeah i don't know who would be opening for who at this point zz top uh, see 1974 that have been post trace ombres with the grange and all that maybe yeah but I, I don't know where they're at with that because i know a uh, year before that ZZ, zz top were opening for alice cooper so I don't, you know, they're, they're, I would say that's kind of a neck and neck thing. Who knows? I, I'd, I'd have to look and do some research on that. But either way would not surprise me. Yeah. Uh, you know, there were a lot of groups in the early 70s that broke later on that were kind of like the perennial opening acts in that era. And and it would be groups like, you know, Kiss did a lot, but they broke then, pretty quick. But then you had uh, Rush, Cheap Rush, Trick, Cheap Trick, Bob Seger. Yeah until about the mid 70s but there in the early 70s he was opening for everybody reo speedwagon sticks mm-hmm. all these groups that would later become fm rock dinosaurs but in the early 70s they were all just struggling like anyone else and you know you see them as a perennial opening act so you know i don't think that these kind of campaigns were all that unusual um and certainly wouldn't be huh. unusual for Kiss. I was kind of sorry. Famous, I was kind of scrolling through, not to interrupt you, but no, d- another interesting band they opened for, or a band that played with them, the Raspberries. 
Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, and Paul always professed to be a big raspberries fan. And I've read different quotes from Eric Carmen from the raspberries being very, uh, very um, uh, critical of Kiss and also being very uh, complimentary towards them. So, mm. again, who knows? I would say the criticism was probably closer to the truth at the time, you know, because Kiss was very intimidating. And, right. and a lot of people were looking at them strictly as a show band yeah. and not hearing the music. Everybody's like, who is this weird band that nobody knows what to do with? Yeah. And a lot of people thought the music was a secondary thing. I always say if they did not have strong records, then they would not have survived just on the act alone mm-hmm. because eventually the act wears out. Now, yeah. I, I, now what proves me wrong is Guar. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, 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 I've never, I, I've never heard Guar as a musical band well, ever. Well, to no take a how, small swipe at them, I think they also might be uh, attributing to the lowest common denominator well, that constantly goes back to that one. So. The, the, but that's the I same with, joke being told over and over again repeatedly, and for whatever reason, somebody still finds it funny every time. Yeah. yeah. I think uh, with bands like Guar, that's kind of the shtick to begin with. No, yeah, and it's kind of a mocking of it or whatever. But, yeah. you know, I think uh, with Kiss, though, they were working, I think they really did care about the music they were putting on the albums, even if you know we talked about hotter and hell feeling a little bit like it was scraped together out of odds and ends and a little mm-hmm. disjointed a little disconnected uh but they were still they they put a lot of effort into it we talked about that the, the you know you can see that creative impulse coming into how they develop these ideas even if they're trying to develop them on the on the fly right but as they're coming through this tour now uh there's a great quote uh of paul stanley you just quoted paul well, one of my favorites was uh he said, uh, when asked what it was like to be rich and famous, he was like, well... I know what it's like to be famous. I know what it's like to be famous. <laughs> Which is great. And a lot of people think that KISS was... Again, they think that KISS was this very coldly calculated money-making scheme, you know, financed by bankers in the Midwest. Well, no. They were really kind of uh, flying by a lot of trust and a lot of credit. Mm-hmm. And again, we we keep and referring Bill of Coins credit Bill, card, Bill of Coins American Express card, which had no credit limit, and he was getting a lot of heat. Going, um, you know, are you intending to pay this off? <laughs> oh, absolutely, mm-hmm. yeah. You, and, you, know, you know it, buddy. To their credit, Casablanca was also piping a lot of money into this. However. Uh, well, we'll get into the. There's some yeah. drama with Casablanca coming out of Dress to Kill. We'll get mm-hmm. into, but um, in the meantime, so they're they're touring. They're still hitting a lot again of the Midwest. This is an important area for them to break. Still, still, they're they're hitting it hard. They're hitting it heavy. And uh, and they go to the West Coast uh, towards uh, January, February of '75. Yeah, they but they're not they're not connecting over there quite as much. There's. Uh, What's the? Is it on this tour that they have the famous footage that exists of them? I think they're opening act at Winterland that wound up. You know the. It's on, yeah, the, so it's on the San Francisco thing. I think it's, yeah. it's it's credited as seventy five, but I think it's actually seventy four. Yeah, the win- I believe the 70, Winterland show was the Harder like Than Hill tour because yeah. there was no Dress to Kill right. songs so on that it's yet. It's still early, and that's them as an opening act. And, and they are just like full of fire. By on this that point, show. you can see if you look at the the difference between some of the footage from like again that exists from early on. That Coventry even the, well, the Coventry to to the to the Dick Clark you know thing to uh, you know the there's the um, well it's attributed to Long Beach but it, as we've since found out it's actually filmed at Michigan Palace mm-hmm. but there's the way they present themselves just as individuals on stage with you know that per, that that performance gets more and more they're more confident more solid performers. If that makes sense? It's yeah, a lot yeah, more absolutely. physical, you know. And so by the time you see that what they're doing here, they're they're not only intimidating just for the theatrics, but just as a, a sheer force of presence, as an energy, as four guys on stage. Mm-hmm. I've always contended that you could take away the makeup and the costumes and the theatrics, and they'd still, you know, once they got to that point, they'd still be an intimidating band. You know, I think they still could have been a successful band. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, a large part of what's attracting an audience right now is probably less to do with their records 
than it did with the live show. I think mm-hmm. it attracted that curiosity. Oh, they blow it, shit up. They, they, yeah. were, they were starting to do uh, the fire and the smoking guitars and the uh, and everything else. More fire this go around. Yeah, and uh, you know uh, they're having to make changes and improvements all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you, you you're still seeing basically um, similar costuming. They haven't put a lot of uh, yeah this emphasis was the, on the uh, costuming and stuff. The costuming is still very um, kind of matches the first album or maybe the first couple of albums. Yeah, yeah. First album didn't really have a signified costume, so to speak. Well, they were a little more cobbled together with mm-hmm. uh, ideas, and now they've probably got someone doing more professional stuff. But of course, I guess it's important to note or interesting to note the costume that Gene had with the skull and crossbones. Yeah, was originally on the skull and crossbones was on his chest, and then as the shirt started to disintegrate he had to turn it around yep and, and it was on his back and, and it, then it, eventually they like cut it off and put it on something else yeah, yeah i don't i don't you know so they're winging it they're still winging it the point is is they don't have a lot of money and they're no. still putting it together with with what they have and lydia was even talking about in those early days they didn't have like because there's different grades of leather that you can get mm-hmm. and they said that they had like too good of leather and it like wouldn't dry oh, yeah. before the next show yeah. so it would still be reeking and yeah. like damp and Ugh. like moldy and stuff like that so you have to imagine you all of us have been in tour buses vans rvs with a bunch of stinky other men that have been playing shows back to back to back imagine now throwing in that those boots and the costumes and all of that just you can't get away from it it is right there beside you in that car the entire time i imagine it was less than pleasant um so you know you've got a band that's still they're in a grind and they're not really breaking yet and but they can kind of feel the forward momentum so there's a positive attitude at some point in Mm -hmm. some way even though the second album hasn't done as well. But now they've been on the road pretty much nonstop, like we said. The entire year. They've come off the road for like two breaks, one of which was to record Mm -hmm. Hotter Than Hell. Um, And honestly, they really only get one more small break right here to record Dress to Kill, and then they hit right back at it, man. But they're in in the studio in February of 75, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep, seven, uh, February of 75, recorded in less than a month. I wouldn't even, yeah, I don't think it's even a full month. I, I've i got, well, I don't have, a, yeah, no, it seems like their, their, their last date they've got on the Hotter Than Hell tour that I've got is somewhere in Indiana on February 22nd, a place called Shever, I don't know if I'm even saying that right, Shearville. Cherville? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they had they had a uh, big break right in between that. It's rather odd. Uh, so it's, at the very end of the Higher Than Hill tour, they had February 1st in Santa Monica. And then they took basically the rest of the month off, which is what I would assume was to record Dress the Kill. Well, I've because got, I've got in February 20th, they did St. Louis, 21st, Chicago, 22nd, um, that Shearville. Shearville, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's so a, it seems somebody's like, actually you know, going to sit out there and hear this one and go, God damn it, it's called. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> immediately but, you know, unsubscribe. And then they don't, they don't go back to the road until March 19th, but that's still no time at all Mm-mm. see i'm so, thinking that's so what when i'm they perceiving might have re- recorded the album would have been it, somewhere in there yeah so what i think happened is after that santa monica february 1st date that's when they record then they finish off those three dates in st louis chicago and sugar Burger Burger. <laughs> 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 if you're gonna mess it up you might as well just go all the way with it right and then because they said that within two weeks of the product being mastered it was already pressed and released. Yeah. So by the time they walk out, it gets mastered. Two weeks later, it's on store shelves. So they're moving. They're moving in in light speed. So here. that mm-hmm. would just make sense that by the time February wraps up and they start up in March, they're like, "Oh, that record's coming out." Okay, call the rest of this the Dress to Kill tour. Well, I, yeah, I don't know that it was formally well, named you know at I mean. that point. Yeah. But, um, Oh, yeah, they go all the way back to New York to do it. They're back in New York. It's interesting that they the record company at this point is really, really in bad, bad straits. Yeah, and they've and I'm I, you know they're 
I'm not sure of the exact dates of stuff like this, but somebody somewhere thought it was going to be a great idea to release a double album of uh, Johnny Carson bits from The Tonight Show. I remember that. (laughs) I know the story, yes. And it wasn't a good idea. And this was a Casablanca thing? (laughs) Yeah, and it about bankrupted Casablanca. To the point where they were like thinking this was going to make them money. Like They they were doing this in a, this is going to save the record company. This is something that should be a surefire hit, and we'll... Johnny Carson's a big star. It's going to help pull us out of this hole. And it'll pull us out of the hole, and now we'll have money, and it didn't. So now there's no money. And there's a famous story of Neil Bogart knowing they're not going to make bankroll and he borrows money from somewhere Mm -hmm. of probably dubious origin and as you know the the whole implication is Casablanca was bankrupt bankrolled by mafia or mob money Mm -hmm. yeah uh, so that, whether say. or not that's true, who knows? <laughs> you know, but the thoughts of opinion of Russ Ward did not. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm just it's the it's the inference. I'm not saying it's true, but he ends up with like ten grand, and he goes to Las Vegas and gambles that literally gambles the money. Literally thinking Jesus. about it, I so get like come back, nervous oh, and yeah. anxiety ridden just is, thinking about is, doing Neil that. Neil Bogart was a, a, a wild character. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and it and it worked. He came back with enough money to make you know to make bankroll for another month or whatever it was, and, and kept them in the in the black just just enough to keep it rolling. And the thing is, man, if he went down there and pissed it away, we wouldn't be talking about Nobody this band would be talking right about here. There's a lot of things that, that are going to happen. That's that singular moment scenario. And it's not just a singular moment. Though. Well, that's There's going to be of one them. of the many singular moments yes. in this year where you can see Kiss just go belly up, and we'd be talking about them as as if they were uh, in Indie my opinion, cult band. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. They would be a cult band. Uh, but that didn't happen. But what happened was what happened was <laughs> that he had the money, and but they didn't have money to. Uh, this time uh pay a producer yeah mm-hmm. so neil neil bogart decided to step neil up bogart decides he's going to produce this thing himself now what kind of production credit neil bogart had to to you know trade on i i would suspect was uh i own the record company yeah <laughs> and, you know <laughs> and, you're, and you're just gonna do what i said <laughs> yeah and and you know according to lore if it is to believe he spent most of it really really high of course. So and so I don't know to what degree he was producing this or to how that that came about versus how much they were self-producing at this point. Considering the production quality of the record too, you know, it's kind of curious to I'm curious to where uh, that dynamic kind of stopped and ended yeah, too. It's it's, it's a, it, that's a lot of uh, a lot of question marks there. I think they were in they were in Electric Lady again, weren't they not? Yeah, they were. Uh, well, actually again, this would be the first time for an album. Yeah. They did their demo in, in but, Electric Lady. But and, and looking through here real quick on Neil Bogart's uh, Wikipedia page, I'm not seeing any producer stuff. I'm seeing a lot about Casablanca, yeah, yeah. you know, that's finding that's my records. Point. Is, exactly, is just backing point, you, you know, up on that. And, we, he, and none of the engineers on the record are like, uh, you know, noted uh, for really much anything, you know. I mean, it's just, uh, I don't have... I don't have the names written down, but there wasn't any link to any of the engineer's work or anything I, like that I, I either. Don't know who, you know what? I should have had that written down in front of me, and I don't. Point being. And you know what? And can you go ahead uh, with your point I was being. Say point being, you know, Paul and Gene might have been more involved with this than, you know, they're willing to admit or, you know. Oh, I'm sure they oh, I think they, they would, would want to they admit. They would cop the claim if they, but it's hard to say. But exactly. you don't hear a whole lot about that with this record. But, you know, they go into this record and it's. What's interesting to me about it is that all of the songs except one are almost exactly two minutes thirty. I was gonna that you you led me in perfect to something I wanted to bring up. Would you consider this in a very very weird way Kiss's punk rock record? Absolutely. I always have said that this is a missing link record. If Kiss had broke up after this record, then we would be talking about it kind of as part of that run that goes from back in the USA by the MC5 to Raw Power by the Stooges to the debut Dictator's record, Go Girl Crazy. 
and then Kiss. Kiss Dress to Kill in the first Ramones record. And there's a lineage there that I think is absolute and unavoidable. There is a line there that is consistent all the way through all those records. I can see Now, it. it's not cool to claim Kiss into that lineage because of all that came after. But at that point in the game, Kiss were not considered a kitty group yet you no. know in fact they weren't they probably didn't have much of a consideration on any level at this point other than they're this anomalous kind of live thing that's happening mm-hmm. they um, kind of had a miss mc5 vibe where it was still kind of rough around the edges you know well, and i think these were but i don't think they were in, in in as much as a lot of the early proto-punk or whatever you want to call it uh, I think they still w- didn't see themselves as being outsiders or underground, and they all still desired commercial success. Mm-hmm. You know, there was no there was no disdain towards commercial success at this point, and and this would carry over even with the Ramones or in the first wave of the punk groups, some of whom did enjoy commercial success. Um, but at this point in the game, I think Kiss that two minutes thirty thing is very much because they're they're eyeballing AM radio. Mm-hmm. And seriously eyeballing, you know, we've mm-hmm. got all these songs are potentially singles. We want to have a song that is going to make it on radio. And I think another way we can even draw the, the punk rock aspect to it, which is one of the first ways I even look at it is. So the whole idea and ideology of punk rock is very DIY, doing it yourself and, you know, damn the big corporate labeled thing, this, that and the other. Let's honestly put in perspective what Casablanca has. So the one big thing they have to their benefit is um, Bill O'Coin with his TV connections. So that would be like... I don't think that's being used a whole lot. Bill O'Coin wasn't part of Casablanca. He's completely... But, in, but, well, he's but, not but, independent but his, of it, but... But his connection to the TV industry is still what helped with the Dick Clark and all that stuff early on getting them. Well, what Burkhart would be perceived... connections, too, though. What would... Exactly. I, this is all... I, I feel that you're just kind of helping my case. Okay. That's no different than if we knew a radio DJ and the radio DJ spun, you know, our record, you know, for a few weekends on the station. Was Johnny Carson so, on TV at the time, too? Oh, yeah. So, so there you go. So, so the way I... See, <laughs> yeah, of course he was. <laughs> I couldn't remember what the time frame was for all that, but Whipper anyway. snapper? <laughs> <laughs> so the way I kind of see it is... All right, well, punk rock bands use all the things at their disposal for their benefit. Kiss just so happened to have a record label at their disposal that's also kind of DIYing it at this point to the where the record label manager is going, I'm going to produce your record because we can't afford anyone else well, to do yeah. it right now. Well, that's and, But it, it was also out of necessity. I mean, it really... Wasn't punk rock out of necessity. But, but it was, yeah, it was taking the what you had at your means of disposal and mm-hmm. making them work for and you. And they just so happened to have a studio at their disposal or like the, the pulls to do that. Well, that just, somebody I find had it, to come off their wallet for that but for the uh, electric lady yeah. studios yeah but, i mean probably Neil. I don't, you know <laughs> you're still they cutting could've... costs doing it themselves producing yeah, right it. so you know i don't know i don't know how truthful it is they you know that they didn't have money for a producer i'm, I'm you know i'm sure that played heavily in you know that was in the thought process mm-hmm. i think if if casablanca had wanted to come up with the money for a producer they could have found somebody yeah and, and they, they would gotten, and um, they would when they go to the live album which we'll get to yeah. but uh in this case though you know this it is what it is they're going to go in they're going to make this thing they're going to make it fast and cheap and a lot of these songs haven't even been written yeah there uh, there was stuff where they're to writing do- it in the studio as they go along yeah now, this is important to note too just versus the hotter than hell where i said everything kind of felt disjointed this this record feels like it's the most cohesive of the three so far. Absolutely, this is, this is coming into an idea where they kind of know what they can do, they know their strengths. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, and it's it's like this is the first real solid Kiss record so far. Everybody's you know strengths are really heightened in this record, and and they're playing to those strengths. And again, but also with knowledge that you know uh, we need to get some of this on radio and you've got those two minute 30 songs and I, and you know what i think something else that also attributes to the two minute 30 songs is all of these songs have a little bit more giddy up to them than the previous two records yeah they don't they don't the other that was something that, it's not so dark you wonder if they, well you know it's coming from the the richie wise thing of 
slow it down Mm -hmm. you know for whatever reason he wanted a particular tempo yeah and here it doesn't feel like they're they're held to that as much they're Mm -hmm. kind of free reigned and yeah it's 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 got a charge to it um i don't know do we just want to do this song by song as we go along here or yeah we might as well because uh again like as we were kind of mentioning you know when we're going through these early records you know Talk, trying to talk tour and everything else is going to be a little difficult because they were just kind of awesome, constantly on the road. It's a, it's a, it's such a blur. But you know, you see also, I think a lot of the energy off this is fed off the fact that they are constantly touring. They are used to playing, you know, at a particular kind of speed every night. Everything is moving in a, you know, it's kind of. It, it's already kind of a machine at this yeah, point. Yeah, it's, it's 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 almost rolling under the weight of its own inertia or whatever. And so. it really also feels like they're writing from what they know from this whole last year, oh, and course. it's even exemplified in the first track, which is "Room Service," both right. uh, written and sung by Mr. Paul Stanley. Yeah, now all the lyrics are kind of celebrating the uh, the lifestyle. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's this point. I mean, what do you sing about? You sing about what you know. And all they've known for this last year is just being on the road. So, I mean, when you start looking at almost all of these songs, they really do kind of have a being on the road aspect to it. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot more reflection on of, of that kind of lifestyle. I think mm-hmm. it's, uh, it's interesting to note the lyric in room service as being from an era where you could get away with stuff that you in saying stuff that you could not do today it no. would be very 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 condemned oh yeah you're singing you know and this would be true all the way through the 70s but it, it, it was true of the lifestyle of a rock star in that era and it wasn't just kiss it was everybody it was everybody and you know and you and look everybody at the, wrote albums like this and the group he set at the time the girls that were coming to see these bands Bands and and how shall we say uh, servicing these bands? So we, we, we all service we, we, room, room service, service there you style. Go. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they were very often uh, of questionable age. Yeah, and you know, and that's even reflected in this song when mm-hmm. he talks about I see her dad, dad. He's, he's getting, getting mad. mad. You know, uh, sweet sixteen, looking mm-hmm. hot and neat. Yeah. This was not unusual, you know. The groupies and they in that revisited era, again in a few records. There was a moment there where they had a magazine that was dedicated to these rock groupies, and they were they were they had their own names. They, they were had, communities, and they had bands after they a minute were too. Famous for being who they were: Sable Star and Lori Lightning. See, of course. Pamela DeBar. She was already kind of out out of the scene by this point. Really, and she'd already got she married Michael DeBar and. I think, you know, whatever. She was kind of a queen, but, you know, she's written so many great that's books a, that kind of document the, this, exactly, and they're and really worth seeking out. Her book is, uh, by, uh, I'm with the band, is one of the best rock books ever written. It's so such a great book. And that's how I know, kind of like sort of know about that culture is like she through was, her, really, because she, she has been so vocal about it. She was looking at this current crop of, of, of these teenagers coming in is like, you know, the enemy at the time she was oh, wow. not a fan and the fact that these guys were going for it and she was offended by it you know because she was 20 you know 21 she felt like an old maid at 21 I'm like <laughs> how, what you know essentially penny lane and uh, almost famous <laughs> yeah but uh but these girls were young and it was you know there was the ones that that kind of had names and then there were a thousand more that you never heard of mm. but uh, obviously, they were uh, an important quotient on the road, and room service celebrates that in a very explicit way. <laughs> yeah. I, one of my favorite tracks on the record, though. It's got a good pace to it. I like the tempo. Um, I like the little breaks in it. It's got a good Paul vocal. Just say, that, I need some mo, you know, stuff like that. I, just, I dig it. And we got that Chuck Berry riff I, in I, it. I, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll use this opportunity to talk about Paul's vocal style right now. I prefer Paul's vocal style in the 70s. And it seems like at some point in the 80s, he got some sort of vocal training. And decided that he could do whatever. Bon Jovi. <laughs> bon Jovi. Bon Jovi. All, that, all, that, wah, all that crap. I've never liked that. Yeah. I don't like, you know. You don't like I the like, Fulchers commercial where he sings about putting Fulchers yeah, in your cup? I don't. I don't like any. I'm, I'm like, I think it hurt him. I think he had a real cool, raw rock and roll vocal style that all through the 70s before he got any kind of formal training or whatever. I think that lends to uh, all great rock and roll is that. 
you know, it's that it's steeped more in a folk tradition that it doesn't matter how good of a vocalist you are, you know. It's but an Paul, attitude. Paul was very much an influence. You can tell. Uh, I would say probably primarily from you know Steve Marriott from Humble Pie. Yeah, I mm-hmm. think that was a giant influence on him. Uh, Steve I don't Marriott know how could... conscious he is of it himself. I don't know. I know he's acknowledged it, but I, I see that. And certainly, Paul Stanley was not a Steve Marriott, and that's not an insult to Paul Stanley because who the fuck is Steve Marriott? That guy was a fucking. He was a beast, un- unbelievable. But he had like a blues yeah, thing going that, on with that, him. That guy was a, some whole other thing. But to aspire to that or to be influenced by that, that's a good influence to have. Mm-hmm. And I think that gave. Paul kind of a, you know he had kind of a snottiness in his vocal that he lost later on and I think that that's a speaking of snot I think I just bit some snot out of my mouth here <laughs> anyway, yeah, that's what a popper stopper's yeah. for <laughs> well, where, where the hell did that come from <laughs> um, so anyway you know, I just thought I'd throw that in for the audience to enjoy um, <laughs> no but I agree there's definitely a little bit of sass to uh, Paul's vocal delivery oh, all yeah. over this album and that's what that sassy kind of raw you know it's like it's making up for the fact that maybe he's not a quote unquote great vocalist mm-hmm. but that's what makes it great you yes. know and I think a lot of people lose sight on that it's like we're talking talked about in the last episode about this sort of academic kind of idea it's kind of steeped in this you know european tradition that you must be a great instrumentalist and a great vocal you you know me a a master of your craft and a virtuosic and i'm like you know there's a point where rock and roll is just like fuck all that man we're just gonna fucking rock man this is what you know you know and that's where kiss is working so strongly particularly at this point i think we're at the apex of what they would ever be. I think when they're still raw, hungry, exciting, they're just, you know, it's piss and vinegar. It's mm-hmm. snotty. And the attitude is a little bit like, yeah, we're, we're with Sweet 16. Yes, that's what we are, you know. Yeah. And it's unapologetic and it's, you know, it's it's, it's rock genuine. and roll. It's genuine and it's as, uh, it's as strong and as, as gutsy and cool as it's ever probably going to be. But that we'll we'll explore more another as we get along. But and, no, and, and I would agree because <laughs> I I one hundred percent echo everything you said because kind of reviewing this record again, uh, I think this one and um, his vocal on Rock Bottom are probably his best vocals of the yeah. first three records. Rock Bottom is such a great song too. Oh yeah, we'll, we'll get there. We'll get it. Yeah. So, so room service for everyone. How do we feel on that? It's, it's a great, great one. Song. Oh, right. Of course, it's great. All right, excellent. Moving on, uh, we've got the Simmons written and sang two timer. Not so great. I was gonna say going from huge highs to immediate huge lows oh, for I me. I disagree. I like this song, and I'll tell you why. I just again, it goes into that kind of teenage attitude. And what's ironic about it is that Gene Simmons is talking about an experience that you know i would relate it to a kind of a 60s greaser experience the american graffiti car thing and that's something that even i didn't participate in but i know it exists and it existed as much as recently as i was a kid yeah i'm sure it exists to some degree today but uh you know that whole line about you know she says she loves the fast cars and she, she says she loves mine the best you know see I, I thought that was an was innuendo a, really <laughs> I never did. I, I always thought that she no, likes fast cars. Says she I likes mine the best. It might be, but I always took it she as being literal. And rest. maybe I'm stupid, but I just always <laughs> read it as a literal thing that it was just that it's a teenage thing. It's oh, like very well could you know be. your calling card as a teenager might be the fact that you've got a boss car. Oh yeah, you know this whole album reeks of Detroit to me. This is their Detroit proto punk record. And I, I see think, that. I can I, see that. Know, this is part of what makes this is my you know it's neck and neck it's one of my two favorite kiss albums you know i don't think you're wrong now that i'm kind of taking it more in the literal aspect and then after you said detroit vibe i really do kind of catch i see what you're saying now you might have a double entendre to it and that's fair but i just think that you know this song is just about you know it's a teenage idea and i think it's you know it's it's intended to be a teenage idea I i think my problem with this is like your problem with hotter than hell so like the lyrics were kind of teenagery, so yeah, that's fine. The riff is just so boring, and it's just it plods I can, too I can hard. Hear, I can hear um, say that. Th- that fake live version that was on you wanted the best, you got the best from the nineties. It's probably not entirely fake. Well, the the alive right, right, version. Right, right, right. I like that one because it was a little sped up, and there was a little bit more like guitar work in it. Like it didn't seem so bam bam. 
Well, bow down. Bow, bow, well, I think they're they're also conscious of the time because I mean, when we get done with this, you got about a thirty minute record. Yeah, mm-hmm. and, you know, it's it's and, and a lot of that is eaten up by a bullshit intro and in rock bottom. Well, <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of it on the original press was eaten up by uh, extending the time between yeah. the songs. Yeah, the, the extended the, groups because they didn't. You know, they're like, we need they're more trying space. To mask that it's not a fully, but oh, this works the to beginning of this. Me. It even said at the beginning of this, there was even like they filmed some of like the run times on the back of the record, oh, saying yeah. like certain songs, songs were, were longer. longer than they actually were. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, so uh, yeah, two tire. At least for me personally, and eh, that that I'll, honestly, like, it might be my. It is. I look it through it. That is my least favorite track on the record. I like the uh, kind of the R and B uh, style in the chorus, though those little harmonies that are stacked up right there. I know, right? Speaking of fast cars, yeah, see, he, he makes a day, he makes a special guest on every one of our shows. Not maybe every episode, but every show is he that gets be us- noticeable. <laughs> oh yes, yes, he's on every uh, show at some point well, in time. Well, there's no Props better to time our- for him to, to make his appearance. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> there we are. Yeah, and uh, yeah. So, uh, but Russ, you like two timer? I do. I, I like well, again. I like this whole album front to back. Yeah, this is definitely one of my least favorite songs on the album though well then after that we've got another simmons written and sang ladies in waiting i have always loved this song i think I, do, it's cool. I like this one a lot better it's so cool and and you know it's it's got some of that nonsensical gene lyric but you know i mean you know what he's talking about you know what he means mm-hmm. i mean and the the entendres are not if it's about clever a, if it's about a girl <laughs> then you know what it means it's it's what it is but the what's unusual about this song to me is the the weird uh twin lead on it yes yeah. i love it though. And, and, and then it, you know and then how it feeds into each other at the end uh something that i've never you know it's an anomaly on any versus anything they've ever done before or since and uh it it's to me it's a big hook on that song it's yeah just, we were literally commenting on that today because we were jamming out that record going and doing some errands again and yeah as soon as that part came on both of us immediately went quiet and just like Damn, this is such a good part of the song. Yeah. Again, on this album, there's so many great Ace moments, so many great guitar moments in general. And, and they would they would wind up playing this live a handful of times, and and you would think they would have figured out a way for Paul and Ace to do that together. I know, right? But they don't, and and it doesn't quite hit quite the same way. But uh, you know, I don't see this as being a potential single, and and for a lot of reasons, even though it's still clocked in at what 230 somewhere in there 235 so you know they're still working in that that framework but um it's this is just a good solid hard rock song i you know it's it's got that same kind of like you said that kind of snotty vibe to it Mm -hmm. and and it's leering and it's crude and it's boorish and any anything bad you want to say about it but guess what all that bad makes for a really fucking great song. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if yeah. it weren't all that bad, then you would not have the greatness that it is. So, you know, it sometimes it's got to be doubled down on its own badness. Yeah. <laughs> I, honestly, I don't think I can say anything else other than that. That's fucking beautiful. That's what, do you, what I'm what, saying. What do you think of Lays and Wait and Count? That's one of my favorites, too. Um, trying to look at, I'm looking at the track listing right now as far as it being in my top three. Probably not my top three, but it's yeah. definitely a great track. Yeah, I like this one. I, for everything Russ said, um, I think it's a better two timer. I think it's the same kind of vibe and mental attitude as two timer, but just better delivered. I just I like it a lot better. Yeah, I can see that. That's a good point. And then uh, next track, uh, written by Ace Fraley, sang by Peter Chris. Um, definitely a deep cut in my opinion, but one that doesn't get enough love. Getaway. This is a great song. I love this one too. This one might be in my top three. And, this, and one of the few songs on the record that was actually played in standard tuning. Every so often they'll mess with you and play a song in standard tuning because most of the time they're in E flat tuning. Yeah, they're usually half step down, right? Yeah, so yeah. usually they're in an E flat tuning. This is one of the few, if I'm remembering correctly, because it was one of the few I could actually figure out on guitar and I remember like being on the dots. <laughs> well, that's the, See, I did not know that. That's an interesting thing to note because there's also, I mean, this is another one of those very unkiss like songs to me it sounds this is an out this is what you called the outlier or whatever this is deep it, cut at least it makes it, it it's an unusual kind of song it's not like anything ace Frehley had written no, or, no, or no would song, ever write again no really. song that he writes is kind, kind of you know you know in line with anything 
I would almost maybe, I don't know if I'm doing it only because of lyrical content, I would almost pair this next to Speeding Back to My Baby. Like yeah, I said, I don't know I if I'm doing see, it because okay. of lyrics. No, yeah, yeah, there's a style there I could see. But, that kind uh, of chuggy, ba dum ba bum yeah, bum I don't know, but it's still a little different. You're right. But I tell you, it's 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 still a great song here, and and I'll, I'll tell you, um, uh, the secret weapon in this is Gene's playing on this, the bass line. Oh yeah, boom, 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 boom. See, boom. I keep seeing that it was Ace that was uh, that tracked the bass on it. See, I don't. Th- that that, that sounds like so Gene. Too. That sounds like a Gene riff or bass playing to me, and I don't. I, I love that little possible, line but, too. Yeah. It's uh, it's really inventive and really clever, and it's kind of the last time you will see Gene doing stuff like this because, as they move on into other albums and stuff, that kind of kind of inventiveness and creativity, those walking bass lines, start mm-hmm. slowly evaporating from the from the his style, and I don't know why. I but, think it's just because he wasn't engaged with it anymore. That's, well, that, that's a possibility, but it just seems like to me, it's like, you know, it's unlike anything else that they would later do. Yeah. And like I how think much? that it make it really opens up that song and it's such a subtle thing. I mean, it's really, I mean, unless you're, you know, consciously locked into it, you could listen to it a million times and, and until someone pointed it out, you might not notice it, mm-hmm. which is part of its strength is that it doesn't over, you know, it's not overbearing or whatever. It's just such a clever little thing that he's got rolling underneath it. Oh, yeah. And it opens up the whole song. Mm-hmm. Especially that little, like, low, a little uh, bouncy little line that he does. It's, it's, um, uh, and if Ace did play it, it's great. It sounds like a Gene yeah, thing, but it, it's just, that just feels so Gene. Yeah, it does still feel like Gene. But, but hey, hey, it's wrong. a great song anyway. Ace wrote it, and you know, and Peter does a great. I mean, who else but Peter could sing that? No one. Again, Gene wouldn't have sang that. The, Paul wouldn't have sang that. The well. other, no. the other great strength Kiss had that they didn't utilize enough and encourage enough, and it, and it makes me mad that he, I see Paul denigrate it so much. Is Peter Chris and Peter Chris's voice. He couldn't hold a tune in a bucket. Well, then why don't you help him with that? Yeah. Rather than <laughs> you're just, such a good singer. Rather than drown him in that bucket, why don't you fucking help him? I mean, mm-hmm. this when is, you're this on is, those long car rides, why don't you work with him and go, know, hey, sing some harmonies this. with encourage me? Encourage the guy to, to develop more. And you know, but of course they were hogging the spotlight for themselves, which is understandable. Then they're a lot, you know. But I don't think at this point they're allowing their egos to. To uh, eclipse anything, I think. Not yet. Yeah. <laughs> I think Not you're going to get there, but I mean, at this point in the game. You they know, don't have the money. The and, money comes, the ego comes with the money. But, but you know, as a unit overall, each guy running as an individual, uh, you know, for what they do, be it their instrumental contribution as, as, as musicians, quote unquote, or as singers, is all strong, you know. And Especially Peter, on and, this one with and, Ace's solo. Uh, yeah. Well, I was going to say, I'm still on Peter. Though, yes, I'm yeah. just saying, you know, Peter's very underrated what he does here. You know, he's a great rock and roll drummer. Mm-hmm. You know, is he a technically proficient drummer or whatever? We've talked about this before and maybe not. I don't, you know what? I don't care. But he plays that groove. He's got that swing yes. and it's, and it's, and he's got a swing that a lot of drummers didn't have. Mm-hmm. Certainly the drummers after him didn't have. And it, and that was their detriment. It doesn't matter how proficient they were. They couldn't bring that, that, that swing to what Peter brought. Mm-hmm. And Peter also played with a manic energy in this period that was a lot more exciting. Well, you know, yeah. whatever, hey man, whatever got him there, it worked. I never hated his singing voice either. You talk about that Detroit rock sound. I think his uh, singing voice definitely uh, lent to and that. It, and it plays so much into that, you know, where that influence seems to be coming in, where they've got that kind of angular R&B kind of influence that they don't readily acknowledge. And I don't even know how, how well, aware R&B of it them too. themselves are because when you're getting influenced by stuff, it's not always a conscious influence. No. So, I'd argue the co- course of two-timers R&B as hell. Yeah. I mean, there's you, you see it coming in in different ways. But uh, Getaway cool. especially. I, I mean, Getaway has a very, very strong R&B kind of vibe. And it's a very street kind of song. And and I love Peter's outro vocals on this. Anytime he starts getting all screamy, like with oh, his, yeah. wow, yeah. baby, get away. <laughs> Fuck yeah, get it. <laughs> <laughs> so I, you know, we gotta we gotta give uh, Peter Chris uh, the accolades that others won't give him because no, it's he well deserved. is well deserved, and he Absolutely. is so vital and so important to this band, and it cannot be understated or ignored or. No matter worse. how much it wants to be rewritten, yeah, you can't write him out of this. This is this is very key, and this song proves it. 
Absolutely, man. And, and again, Ace's solo on this is just manic and noisy. It's just, again, what you were saying, everyone's just firing in all cylinders at this point. It feels like the first like legit Kiss record at this point. This is Kiss. Yeah, they're finally kind of getting zeroed in and tightened down into to who it is and what they are. And then for the first time on a Kiss record, we hear acoustic guitars for the intro of Rock Bottom. Okay, let's just talk about this in and of itself. Yes, mm-hmm. yes. Because I know people have very strong opinions on this mm-hmm. you just expressed it i've seen <laughs> it's com- just too long i've seen comment threads over this that okay. have been extensive all right what's your opinion i don't hate it but it doesn't fit the song it doesn't need to fit the song it just you don't say okay explain then it doesn't need to fit the song i think well i i think it fits but they needed to do the timing like they did on Kiss Unplugged. They trimmed out like three quarters of it. They played the important little riff and then let it drown out and then they kicked it in. Uh, this, it just wasn't this as could repetitive. Have been, this could have been dropped in where Love Theme from Kiss was. Because uh, <laughs> it's still better than that. I mean, yeah. And, and, I, and I gotta say, I, as long as it is, it could go on for another two minutes and I would love it just as much really i have always loved this intro part really i just it's it's there's there's uh, it there's, the led zeppelin thing where it could have been its own track it's got a it's got this sort of melancholic eeriness to it and it it's now see i wish they had done that what cap said made it a whole separate track it could have been its own separate I, track by the time they kick into it oh my god number one shortest kiss song in their entire catalog by right. the time it kicks well, in. well that's the reason why this is yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and number two one of the coolest songs like it gets right to the point it starts with just one guitar and drums and then a bass kicks in and then another guitar oh, yeah. kicks this in a, it's this fucking... is a balls out song and oh it, my god yeah it, it, big it, vocals and everything now what's interesting about this version versus what would come on the live album later which we'll get to is the is the addition of a of a lead break in the middle of it but which could have been here in lieu of this intro you could suggest, you could say mm-hmm. uh it, it, that's all you know hindsight but and in, in like you said it could have stood alone as its own track yeah. how would that have been received who knows but i would like give this another intro. track on the record <laughs> it would give them, yeah it would give them another track yeah it, but i who knows what the what the, the thought process was going into this but yeah. it leads into rock bottom I think we all agree Rock Bottom is... Rules. It's in my top three. It's such a great song. It's such a ripper. That hasn't survived into today's set through the history of the band is kind of a surprise to me. Even if they wanted to like cut the intro, like just have that kind of like, you know how bands do, they'll like hold the last note of a song, have them just click it. Yeah. Sometimes, yeah, yeah. well, it's they, bust right in. They uh, allegedly, the story goes that there for a minute they tried opening shows with this. Ooh, I haven't been at, with the with the intro and everything. I don't know if they did. The they probably intro would just do a clean or, or whatever, guitar. But I, I know they did. There was a handful of shows I think where they opened the show and it just it didn't work for whatever reason. That's and, interesting. Yeah. Ooh, I know a lot and of them always have And then they tried to bring it back on the reunion tour and it didn't mm-hmm. survive the, no. the tour. That's but a damn shame. Unfortunately, though, that was down on Peter's play and he wasn't. I don't hitting know. that the I way mean, I've, well, I've, I've heard that song on the reunion tours yeah. he wasn't mm-hmm. hitting it the way he needed well, to and this they are and it's, oh, a, yes. it's, a, it's a solid solid tune so then we lift the needle flip that bitch over and we got come on and love me such a uh, great fucking song Stanley Stanley Ritten, Ritten, now, sing. here's something you made reference on on the Hotter and Hell album thinking you, you're hearing acoustic here you can definitely hear the acoustic it's mm-hmm. a lot more pronounced they're trying to beef up the sound of the guitar and it I seems like love it it's cool but i don't understand you know why they would feel the need to beef up their electric sounds with it so it it seems to me that it's that might be an ace move i I don't know and the reason i say that is it reappears on his solo record yeah. Think about what's on your mind yeah, I know. and stuff like that. So I think that might be an ace move. It's like, possible. Let's layer them. But then again, it could also as easily been a Paul idea I was as say, well. Very much, yeah. Um, but come on and love me. Uh, what's that clocking in at? I can Two fifty-seven. Yeah, that's. All, I was gonna say it's one of the longer ended mm-hmm. ones. Uh for me, this is in my top three. This, mm-hmm. this is like most of the time like actually when you say dress to kill that's immediately the riff that comes into my head that this is in my top five favorite kiss songs period 
Really? Yeah, it's mm-hmm. a great song. I, I, you gotta, you can't deny that. I will say, though, one of the stupidest Paul lyrics ever. And it's even more like signified because Gene is backing them up. So not only is one person singing it confidently, two people are singing which, it confidently. Which would be? You were distant. Now you're nearer. Oh, I can feel, your I can face feel inside the, the, the mirror. That is the dumbest lyric of 70s Kiss. I got to preface yeah. that. Of 70s Kiss, period. I'll put that up against anything. You were. That is one of my favorites. I can feel felt your pretty, face inside a mirror. Probably, what the fuck does that they mean? They probably felt pretty clever when they That's came up I'm with saying. that. That's what I'm saying. They were like, we're going to do the whole uh, pop song thing and put a harmony on the it's, second verse and everything. That's, that's Kiss's effort at being existential, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, because he, he, he threw out the uh, Capricorn and she's a cancer bit. And I'm like, that's clever. I like that. Not even but, using uh, the R's. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, you were distant. Now you're nearer. I can feel your face inside a mirror. Like That feels like us making fun of Paul. Paul. Go to the fridge <laughs> and get me that. a beer rub. But, but, yeah. but, <laughs> but I ask you this. Would you really want it any other way? No, I wouldn't. You know? I, no, but, if, but look, we've been giving so much love to these early albums. I have to throw out some sort of criticism. <laughs> <laughs> so if, that, if that's my one criticism for the record, there it is. That was dumb Paul lyric. <laughs> that was one of the singles. And I love watching the video for this because it's awkward Gene playing awkward finger style bass. Yes, this well, was the record well, we finally got promo videos. Well, Let's finish the album and then we'll talk about it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, we all agree. Come on and love me. Fantastic. Um, rock and roll, I mean, uh, anything from my baby. Uh, Stan Lee sang and written. Um, the reason I, like I say it. it like that is that it messes me up every time it's on shuffle. <laughs> the drum intro. Because uh, you think it's rock and roll. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can tell the difference between the two. There, the there is but, slight difference, yes. But what do y'all think of this song? I, we talked about this earlier. <laughs> I did. like I like the song, but the the double time drum part in the chorus kind of you know it needs to be it's a little too busy. I think it's more of a roll. Yeah, I was gonna yeah, say roll, yeah, the, yeah the snare roll chorus. I'm not a fan of that, but the verses are fantastic. Those big open chords, the bat bat bang bat, good Paul vocal. Just the chorus this dips a, down a little for me. I love this song. I think this is again leaning in towards their bubblegum sensibility. I could hear this as being a potential single and written to be a potential single. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, it's it's got again. There's an R and B kind of vibe running through it. I can see that. And, uh, you know, again, I, you can't understate that, in my opinion. I don't, again, I don't know how conscious of an R&B influence they were having in that moment, but it comes out, it bleeds out. I see it, especially in the Paul songs. Yeah. You know, you called it the sass, and mm-hmm. it has that kind of a sass to it. I just recently discovered a... a a demo exists of this song. Yeah, I've heard that one. And, you know, and which surprised me because I didn't think that they had anything going into the studio with this. My understanding mm-hmm. was they were literally writing it, you know, coming in every morning going, okay, today's song is this. Learn it, record it, and capture it while they could. I Jesus. didn't run into any of the information during, you know, my recent treks, you know, gathering stuff for this show, but I remember in the past hearing different stuff about, like, if they had, like, a day off on tour, they would just find a local studio and cut ideas. Yeah, so I don't, maybe but, that's but, where some of that came yeah, I from? Or I, don't, I don't know how they would have afforded much exactly. studio time. I think they had, you know, a lot of the stuff I think is uh, what were amateur low end home recording kind of equipment mm-hmm. from that era. Very um, well could have been. There's a lot of information about demos out there, and that might be something we ought to look into. At That'd some be a fun point. special episode, yeah. just a demos because episode. I'm not Ooh, super yeah. familiar with that, but there's people that have been able to kind of figure out who's playing what on these demos because it's not, you know, obviously it's not the other band members, and a lot of them it's just them on with some, who on a lot they got. of on a lot of Gene's uh, early '70s demos that wound up being on the vault. A lot of it was like the road crew yeah, the that road like crew learned guys, yeah. and like guitar well, techs and stuff. Well, the road, some of the one of the road crew guys ended up on one of the albums, but we'll get to that. Um, so anything for my baby again, it's kind of got that R and B feel. It's got that kind of, you know, it's a 
tailor made for radio it was not issued as a single that as far as i'm aware of no i didn't see it listed uh, at the top for a single then, we had rock and roll all night and come on and love me so it, there's another missed opportunity at something but then again i think i'll take this moment to note that casablanca were shoestringing along their their uh ability to even press records yeah and so they had different you know, different pressing plants working at different times to press these records. And I think that probably was very detrimental to them being able to sell records at that point, let alone a single. So, you know, it's hard to promote a single when you don't even have a single in a store to sell. So I think, you know, they were in a catch-22 situation. They couldn't get radio to play Kiss, but even if they could who was going to be able to buy the single if it wasn't readily available. Yeah. You know, because it probably wasn't as readily available as all the major label stuff because Kiss were, I mean, excuse me, Casablanca at this point were completely independent. Mm -hmm. And that's important to note that Kiss are working now, like you said, almost on a DIY kind of level. Yeah. And they had a partnership with a record label that believed in them, but the record label was also working to its own ends of, mm -hmm. as a means of survival. Yeah. So Kiss were kind of on their own and trying to slog their way through it so mm -hmm. they probably missed opportunities that they might otherwise have so anyway i'll i'll jump off the soapbox here and we'll go on to the next one <laughs> well and it just it further i mean you're a master at being able to like even your your tangents even tying into the next thing that's We've got a Wicked Lester track here. She. I mean, it just and goes to show right here, they're just trying to pull anything they can to fill up this record. Well, what they did here, though, is they took a song that was, I would say, mediocre and turned At it best. into something and turned it into something really strong. Mm -hmm. and, really uh, cool. And a little bit of a No Time to Turn history here. Uh, that's the first Kiss song I ever learned how to play, thanks to you, Russ. Because you learned how to play it, and you were like, oh, you know how to play any Kiss songs? I was like, no, I don't. And you're like, I know how to play She. And you showed me that little da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. Well, I, 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 I learned that from your from your stepdad, so. Yeah, well, it's like, but you you would like, you're just like, I could play a Kiss song. And you started playing She. I was like, oh, it's that easy, which then falls back to our intro episode talking about it being yeah. something and accessible I don't to play pick it, up. For a record, I don't play it well. <laughs> but but you hey, were still, it was uh, still something that... The thing. But, but <laughs> here's the thing. She, the only record, or only record, only song on the record to me that it was not written with the idea of it being a single. Yeah, four minutes and eight seconds. Yeah. Uh, there were... That was the album cut. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's uh, it's again, it's that kind of nonsensical kind of lyric, she a gene lyric. It's yeah. like the hook is the riff. It's um, kind of like a Led Zeppelin thing. I, I want to say I think it was Kenny Kerner, and they heard the. It may not have been. I forget. Somebody was the one that recommended them changing the lyric to, you know, she takes off her clothes, which mm -hmm. somehow you know. I remember when I was a little kid, we were like, <gasps> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> she does what? Huh? Yeah. They said that and, on a record, you know. So, uh, and this was you know, a Gene and Stephen me, Cornell written. Uh, yeah, and I don't know what the lyric necessarily is about, but I've always kind of taken it to be a, like Black Diamond. It's about a prostitute. Exactly, that's what I thought I, too. I feel that, yeah. Um, I, uh, this we time, are a sex positive podcast, <laughs> and, and as to how often any of those guys ever employed uh, a, a prostitute is questionable. But Gene, maybe. I, who knows? <laughs> I, I, about this point, I'm sure they weren't paying for anything. No, 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 no. But it's still a great song. It's 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 darker than any other Kiss song that even yeah, even you, off of the other albums. Yeah, I think this is the darkest this on, thing they've come up with. I was gonna say you could hear this on Hotter Than Hell. I think. Yeah, it's a, uh, and it seems like it would have fit that song cycle stronger and hotter than hell. As we talked about in the last album, it seemed kind of disjointed. It probably this would have fit in. A lot more seamlessly. I think know? so. And in this case, this song seems kind of anomalous. Like I could see this being traded out with a coming home. Mm -hmm. Coming home seems to fit this song song cycle a lot stronger. Yeah, totally. I would agree. I but, would agree. You know, at that point, I don't. You know, who knows how much thought was given to this? It was. Uh, let's just get it in and get it done. Basically, I will say though, there's a part of the studio version that never gets played live. That very uh, end, that very end part, that yeah, the it's the very end, yeah, the well, that's, well, that's, well, that's, well, 
they didn't own the recorded versions that you know to exist. They were going well, into yeah, the, they were transitioning into the coda from Let Me Know. Let Me Know and going into the mm-hmm. Aces solo spot. Um yeah, but uh, yeah, I think Roundtable, we all agree, she, very important to the KISS catalog. It's, it's, a, a, it's a solid ripper. one on this record. So that goes into... Love Her All I Can. Another holdover from Wicked Lester, mm-hmm. and completely redone, remodeled, and retooled, and improved incredibly. I think I it's great. I love this song. Yes. You know what I hear, though, when I hear this, uh, with, the, with the vocal delivery and the verses, I hear Grand Funk or Head East. That kind of thing. But I love that. I, love, I do too. I love the whole uh, uh, Paul and Gene kind of singing those chorus uh, verses at the same time, and then Paul just doing the chorus. Yeah. It's pretty cool. It's 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 a lot stronger than the way Wicked Lester, however they had conceived it. It was way soft. Like, suits, even the, even their vocal delivery on the Wicked Lester one was like, "She's so easy to please, oh, and it doesn't take money." Yeah, it, was, it had almost like a jazz kind of bounce yeah. to it. <laughs> And this did. this has the full on drive to it. It's a great riff. Uh, those those fills on the back end of the of the song mm-hmm. with the breaks, oh, you know, oh. all of that. I mean, and it's some good cowbell in the chorus. Yeah, it, all of it is playing to their strengths as to what they could do and what they could do really well. I'm surprised this doesn't bleed over into their live set because it's such a great song. And, and the guitar parts that Ace does so are so well. fucking good too. That's exactly what I was gonna That's say, what, man. That solo bit with the little bow bow. When I was a lot younger, I, I met a guy that uh, was going to try to play music with, and we were talking about Ace's guitar solos having a singable quality. Yes, that you could sing along with them, and 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 we were talking about it, and this guy's wife was like. Nerds. Nah. Yeah. And, Nerds. And, and so what do we do? We put on the kiss song and we start singing just the lead parts. And yeah. this is the song we used, you know. Uh-huh. And I'm like, you can sing along with the notes. You know it. It isn't you know, and that's again goes back to what I talk about, you know, when I talk about these virtuosic qualities in the in the Euro- grand European d- tradition where you get these guys and they're just playing scales and notes and stuff and it's not something you can sing along with. And it's you know, I feel very alienated by that. This I, I don't I feel, feel alienated. This brings you in. It's part of the whole kind of rapturous kind of you know communal whatever rock and roll has. It's, it's the rock and roll church with Paul Stanley the but, preacher. But but at the same time, simultaneously, it also bleeds down to something that's very unique and individual to you as a person, mm-hmm. and that's what makes it kind of cool. I think uh, I think it's what makes a lot of what Kiss works well. At, oh yeah, because it's. It's not even so much what you share as what you have for yourself and what it means to you as an individual. And that's so important. And, you know, and then you find you've got this little thing, you know, it's like you're like, I've got this little candle. And you walk in and you're like, oh, you've got one too. <laughs> yep. And, you know, you if know, we put the so candles it's like, together, you know, the flame gets bigger. bigger. And now we've got something, you know. But at the end of the day, I can always go home with my own candle. Exactly. You know? So, you know, this song is a very underrated, overlooked a great song. I wish they had played it live more. In contrast to the next song, I mean, <laughs> well, you know, you can okay, rock and roll all night. You can say, you know, it's played out. It is what it is. No. Uh, it was not this version that became the hit. No. Um. So that's kind of important to note. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they tried. They released it as a single, of course. But they were still centering their the climax of their show on "Let Me Go Rock and Roll." Yeah, which that honestly, was the big that was their big closer for, for my opinion. I think it's a more fun closer. Well, yeah, I don't I don't disagree. I mean, as fans, but we can agree point, with that all day. But. but at this point, we're all talking from hindsight. Oh yeah, and having you know, I mean, I've kind of grown up with this. This is the first Kiss song that I can remember hearing when mm-hmm. I was a little kid, hearing it on the radio after seeing them on TV and not really knowing what it was. Yeah, and my brother going. That's that band. That was where the connection was made. Was with this song. Now Love I don't it. know if it was the studio version or live version because I'm. It was almost fifty years ago, right? Yeah. So, you know, this song is important to me in a lot of different ways. Now, again, you, you know, as any seasoned Kiss nerd, it's kind of like that duality where it's like... It's our Blitzkrieg bop. You can't, you don't want, you know, if I never heard it again, I'd be okay. And then you go see them live, and if they didn't play it, you'd be walking out going, God damn. Yeah, you're still sticking around play, you for know? all the confetti and everything around it. So, I mean, you know, and I, I can imagine there's nobody more sick of this song than the band themselves. Yeah. But having said that, 
coming into this. You know, this is, uh, you know, they're, they're reaching for an anthemic, you know, uh, song that, you know, that would put everybody's fist in the air and can pump along and sing along. Mm-hmm. And it worked. I mean, that's, this is not an easy song to write. This no. kind of music is not something that just, if anyone could do it, everyone would. Yeah. This Maybe. is something that's pretty special. As, as tired and, and, and wore out as it might seem now, especially in and of its moment. Mm-hmm. You know, who writes something like this? Slade? And this is very, you can tell there's a heavy Slade influence on, oh, on yeah. this whole album, really. I mean, and I, again, how conscious that is, I don't know. I, I feel that at least Slade is probably one of them. Slade and Led Zeppelin are probably the most conscious that they are with their influences at that time. Well, I mean, certainly Slade. I yeah. think this anthemic kind of let's, you know, get the everybody, you know, stamp your feet and clap your boots. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and whatever. Everybody get up, have some fun. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, what the whatever. exact quote is. I just listened to yeah. it today. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. so <laughs> it's, it's, it's a great song. It's the perfect song to close with. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm surprised that they didn't have a hit straight out of the shoot with this, that it would take another six months <laughs> six whole months oh wow and a whole other yeah, all they, album so, all they had to do was put a fake audience and a guitar solo yeah. over it <laughs> well, well, yeah, but, but here it is and you know it's it's just the lyrics aren't necessarily nonsensical they're, they're they make they're, sense they're pretty pointed it's very much you know uh, again a teenage kind of mm-hmm. experience mm-hmm uh, I mean, even know. fun little lyrics like "You're looking fancy and I like your style." Yeah, it's yeah, like it's, it's like, just that's kind of cool. a corny lyric, but it's a cool lyric. You know? I mean, and, and best chorus, just, r- best written chorus of all time, though, or one of them. I mean, I want to rock and roll all night and party every day. You know, yeah. it's that Iggy Do Pop you thing. not? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Who doesn't want that? You know, as you get older, you want to rock and roll all night and part of every day. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you, you want a little bit of time to sleep, but. <laughs> But at that point in time, you know, you've 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 climaxed this album with an all time classic. And how often does anybody get to say I've written one of the all time classic rock and roll songs? Oh yeah. You know And the thing is, again, exactly what you're saying, com- this is coming from three jaded KISS fans that have it's, every time we see those four faces, more than likely they're playing that song. But what I would give to hear that song again for the first time. Yeah. That yeah. that that's the true testament of it is imagine hearing it for the first time or imagine showing it to someone for the first time because I've met people that have genuinely never listened to Kiss and I'm like oh they're that rock and roll all night band and they're like yeah I don't I don't know so there's like a well, small pocket yeah, of people weird. that are starting uh, to I not know catch everybody about that. that knows that song but I mean that's just odd to me that someone wouldn't but I guess we're probably getting to a generation where you've mm-hmm. got people that aren't rock and roll fans at all which so is which is a little odd to me but it's like they're aware right of what now. kiss is yeah, there's a and they but they can't make they, the audio make connection. connection well and uh, I'll tell you it's another thing that's interesting to note and this we'll wrap up with this is a uh, 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 a perception of uh, what people have had of the band visually versus what they sound like sonically. Mm -hmm. And for some people, those two do not interlock. They can't, you know, and I, I didn't initially understand that a friend of mine made a comment about that. He was like, and then recently I saw somebody post a meme on Facebook mocking what they, you know, what kiss looks like versus what, they sound mm-hmm. like and they used a picture kiss looks like and it was the clown from it what they sound like it was ronald mcdonald <laughs> <laughs> and that was funny you know but i get it because i had the same disconnect with when i first got into alice cooper i can see that and, yep. and mm-hmm, I, mm-hmm. I understand there was a disconnect now with kiss i can't see it or hear it any other way because i've never known any different you know from the yeah. get-go it was all the same thing but you know, for some reason, that perception seems to distort with people, and they have a hard time connecting the imagery with the with the music. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I did to an extent when I first got into the band. Like I, I knew about them before I heard them, and when I first heard "Rock and Roll All Night," the live version, uh, it didn't sound like what I saw, but I still liked it, and it still kept me curious. So let me ask you this: since you're one of the few at the table, or that we may be able to get in contact with. What did you imagine Kiss sounding like, especially coming into it in the mid 2000s when you did, with so much other things coming at you? What did you expect them to sound like? I would expect I expected them to scream a lot more. 
Really? Even knowing that they were like a 70s band? Yeah. That was one thing that, you know, when I was getting into music that my parents would always say. is like, oh, I don't like that band, or I don't like him because they scream, or yada, yada, yada. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. But I think that that visual kind of thing alienated people from different ends. It was mm-hmm. people that w- were like, wow, that looks really cool. And then they'd hear it, and it would a- they would feel it. And then would people that hear it go, wow, I really like this. And then the visuals would alienate them. Yeah. It took a lot to tie that together. And actually, we're going to run a little long here. I've got one last thing I want to <laughs> discuss because this kind of ties into the visual aids and this is also important to the overall lack of money and everything the album cover for this yes was not shot expressly as an album cover the album cover was actually part of a series of photos that was shot for a photo feature for cream magazine by bob gruen okay where kiss are called upon as as superheroes to stop mm-hmm. I think a John Denver concert okay I've yeah. heard this story and, so and, there's, there's, and there's a great oh go ahead sorry there's the pictures of them in the suits as the ordinary Clark Kent versions and they all march into a um, photo uh, booth no, I mean a phone a, booth a phone booth which of course kids now are like what a phone booth phone booth yeah. once upon no, a time we're, we're not there do used this. to be pay phones <laughs> on the corner that were in these freestanding booths this so anyway. was part of Superman lore right. you know <laughs> so you know and then they go into the phone booth and then they come out the other side and full blown kiss yeah you know? I, I love it. they made a photo composite of that yeah. where they made like the photo right. booth ex- like exactly the, the same center. yeah yeah and it shows like just a version of kiss walking in one side and, and, and the fully costumed yeah. walking on the other these side co- and these these suits they're wearing are ill fitted because a few of them are bill of coin suits. Because yeah, Peter the was the only one that had a was suit. The yep. only one that actually had a suit. Yeah, Peter, who who'd have thunk it? <laughs> and the, and the, obviously, jeans is completely ill fitted. I, I love how fucking short it is on yes. it. <laughs> but but it, you know, all of that works. It works yeah. to the to the end design, and it's like I don't think. Well, we actually saw it with um, they did that John von Vardis thing in the mid two thousands where they recreated some of the dress to kill oh, look, yeah, yeah. and it's like and everyone was in a really nice suit tailored suit it, it doesn't work it doesn't the same fit, way but Again. Gene in that ill-fitting suit with that grin on his face there's a certain there's a amount menace of, about yeah. it yeah mm-hmm. there's something that the, if, if it had done it if it had been a tailor suit it probably wouldn't have worked the same way no that so, ill-fitting suit really did just fit and so, actually I'll, I'll uh, make it go a little longer and also say in my opinion something very important that happened during this era uh, that kind of l- tried to mesh the visuals with the sound a little bit more is they did the promo videos way before MTV was even a thing. Right. Well, that was more, I think, at the time for... Uh, Promoters. Promoting in, on the European market or in places they could not yet necessarily tour. There was probably, a, you know, obviously probably a multi-use kind of idea for these promo films they made mm-hmm. uh, yeah but just from my understanding just anytime a band did do that it was kind of for press kiss but and- this actually still comes a little bit later on and it'll be something that'll tie heavily into the next episode okay, then we'll do it then. excellent which of course is kiss alive mm-hmm. and uh we hope everyone joins us for this one because it's going to be a lot to discuss on that it'll be a oh, meaty, yeah. very meaty subject Ooh, to, yes. to bite into <laughs> <laughs> and uh we hope you're enjoying our uh, take on everything thus far mm-hmm. and taking this ride with us and uh, we hope to see you next time. So for Alex Stiff and Cap Nunn, I'm Russ Ward, and this is No Time to Turn, a Kiss Nerd podcast. Good night! Thank you for listening. Please insert another coin by supporting the show for as little as a dollar a month at patreon.com slash somethinggoodnetwork.